All right, now, um, the sermon tonight is going to be um, about tithes and offerings. And I want to give this disclaimer right off the bat because I don't care about money at all. I don't care. I don't, I don't preach for filthy lucre's sake. That is not my goal. You know, there's a lot of churches out there where the pastor is afraid to preach things from the Bible because they don't want to offend people because it's going to be running off the money and they care about that money coming in because they just want more and more of it to roll in because they're lying in their pockets. That is not who I am and I don't care about that money one bit for myself at all. That's not why I preach. And to be honest with you, I don't even collect a paycheck from the church. Not that it's wrong to do so. I think it's perfectly fine for the pastor, for the preacher, for the church to get paid by doing God's work. I think it's completely legitimate. But that is not what I'm about whatsoever. However, I do preach all of God's word. And God's word speaks about giving tithes and about giving offerings, actually in many places throughout the Bible. So I'm also not going to go to the other extreme and just never preach on this subject because I'm afraid that people are going to think, oh, all he cares about is money. So uh, either way, I mean, either way, people are going to be upset with you probably when you preach a sermon like this. Some people, some people are going to be saying, oh, yeah, you just care about money. Or, um, you know, if you never preach on it, then God's going to be upset with me because I'm not preaching the whole counsel of God. So I'm going to go with God's word and hopefully we could just examine all. There's a lot of scripture that I have tonight. I'm going to try to try to get this taken care of in as quick the amount of time as possible. But there is a lot of scripture dealing with this subject. And I know Sebastian, was just, we were just talking about this on Wednesday night. And uh, my goal is really just to help you to understand you know, what God expects of us, you know, what, what's the difference between tithes, offerings, alms, you know, we read about all these different things in the Bible and what is, what is, um, what is our responsibility. And, um, my goal is also that, you know, this whole church would just be right with God on every aspect. You know, if, if I were to not preach on these things, Hey, if God's expecting something from you, then you ought to do it. And um, obviously that's between you and God. I don't sit here and just, you know, make a checklist of like who's giving tithes and who's not. Look, that's not my job. It doesn't matter to me. You know, that, it matters to me just in the sense that I want you to be right with God. That's it. But I'm not going to be hounding people or going after you if you're not giving. Hey, look, that's between you. It's just like any other sin in your life. If, if you don't do something, I'm not going to be, you know, knocking down your doors, you know, saying, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Look, that's between you and God. I'm just going to preach God's word and we're going to leave it where me. I just want to give that disclaimer because, you know, and, and by the way, everything in this church is free. Everything. We don't, whether it be an activity, when we have the lunches like we had this afternoon, everything that we do is free of charge. We are supposed to buy the truth and sell it not. If you want a Bible, you want a songbook, hey, this all belongs to the church and it's free. And we're here to try to spread God's word and do that great work as much as possible. You know, the whole church is functions off of the offerings and the tithes that we receive. But, but hey, freely we've received, freely we're going to give. And we are not going to make God's house a house of merchandise. As I mentioned this morning, that is the reason why Jesus Christ made that whip and drove people out of the temple and flipped over the money changers' hands because they made God's house a house of merchandise. And that is not what this, is, this church is going to be. We do not sell anything here. But let's get into, this, let's get into the subject here in uh, Malachi chapter 3. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? So basically, he's rebuking them, saying, Look, your fathers are gone away from my ordinances. I gave you these instructions, I gave you these laws, and you're just walking away from them. You're not doing them. You're not, you're not, you're not following the ordinances and the laws that I've that I've commanded you to do. And he's and he's still giving them a chance. He's saying, Look, return unto me, and I'll return unto you. Look, if this is okay. This is not irreparable. You could come back to me, but you just have to follow my ordinances. And he says in verse eight, he says, Will a man rob God? Now that's something serious. If you actually think about that, you think about you know stealing something that belongs to God. That's a serious sin. Most people, if you were to ask them, how would you feel about robbing God and actually taking something and stealing something that belongs to God? You'd be like, no way would I ever do that. You know, anyone who has even a smallest fear of God in their hearts would be like, I am not going to touch anything that belongs to God. I would be seriously afraid of what God would do to me if I decided to put my hand against the Lord and to steal something. So he says this question, will a man rob God? He says, yet ye have robbed me. 
But ye say, wherein have we robbed you? So they don't even know. They're ignorant. They're saying, what do you mean we robbed you? You know, we're not robbing you. What do you mean? And he says, in tithes and offerings. He says, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now there herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, just to clarify, you know, that word tithe, it's an old word. Basically, it just means a tenth. It's one tenth. So one tenth of your increase, one tenth of what you make, that belongs unto the Lord. We're going to see that in, in, in later scriptures. But he says, look, prove me with this. He says, have faith. Give me what belongs to me, what belongs to the Lord. Give your tithe. And he says, prove me with it. Just start doing it. He says, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God's basically saying, look, I'm going to take care of you. You know, so many people today say, well, I can't tithe because I can't afford it. I've got too many bills. I've got too many miles of you. I got all this other stuff going on. I can't pay God. But God's saying that you're robbing him because that, that money, that increase belongs unto him in the, in the first place. He's saying, look, I know you have a lot of stuff to pay for. You may have a lot of mouths to be, you know, you might not have all the wealth of this world and, and you're struggling. But he says, look, do this. Just have the faith and do it and prove me. Prove me. Test me. See if this works. He says, I will make sure you know, he says that, that you'll get, you'll, I'll pour out a blessing upon you that there's not going to be enough room to receive it. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 27. Actually, forget Leviticus. Go to Numbers 18. I'll read Leviticus for you. There's a lot of scripture. You don't have to, you're not going to be turning all of them. I've got a lot of stuff to go through here. But look at, um, turn to Numbers 18. I'll read from you Leviticus 27, 30. The Bible says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Again, that's what I was saying. That belongs to God. So when you refuse to pay that tithe, when you refuse to give that money unto God, that's how you're stealing from him because he said, look, that already belongs to me. So when you don't give that to me, now you're just stealing it. The tithe is not something that, that you just feel in your heart and say, you know what, I'm going to give some money to church. Or I'm going to give some money to God. No, the tithe belongs to him. The tenth belongs to him. Anything that's over and above that is an offering. And that would be more like a free will offering. We'll get into that in a little bit. He says that it, that it, it's, it is the Lord's. It says, and if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And what that means is that sometimes people, you know, for whatever reason, they need that money instead of being able to give it to God. He says, okay, if you're not going to pay that tithe, then when you do pay it, you got to add the fifth part to that. So you, you do basically it's 20% it's of whatever your tithe would be. So like, let's just say for easy numbers, you know, you made hundred dollars and your tithe would be $10, but for whatever reason, you know what? I want to redeem that. I want to keep that back for myself instead of paying God. He says, okay, well, that $10 that you know, you're going to add the fifth part to that. So it'd be $12. then when you give that money to God, that's the, that's basically what he's saying there. Um, he's kind of allowing for you to redeem that. But then, then when you give it back, you, you add the fifth part there too. He says, and concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Holy is like separate, separated or sanctified <laughs> unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So he's saying the tenth of the herd or the flock, he's saying basically when you, you know, as, as far as animals are concerned, when they reproduce, and you just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The tenth one that belongs to God. He's saying you're not supposed to be looking and like only giving God the bad, you know, the bad animals, the stuff that's not going to be. He said, look, whether it's good or bad, God gets the tenth. God gets that 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 one out of ten. And and you're not supposed to change it at all. A good one for a bad one, or a bad one for a good one. Just just whatever it lands on. That's the way it is. You're in Numbers 18. Look at verse number 24. Look at verse number 24 of Numbers 18. The Bible says, But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes, 
which I have given you from them for your inheritance. Then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this is your heave offering shall and this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the, of the winepress. Thus ye shall offer and heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give there of the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. So basically what he's saying here is that, you know, the Levites were the one who received the tithe. So when the children of Israel, they'd bring in a tenth of all their goods, and the Levites, see, their job was to serve the Lord continually. The tribe of Levi was, was, was separated from all the rest of the children of Israel. The tribe of Levi was chosen, and, and they had the ordinances of the tabernacle. They were the ones who were responsible for making sure the showbread was out, for, for offering up the sacrifices. People would bring in sin sacrifices and all this other stuff. And the tithe was there to basically take care of the Levites because they needed to eat too, but they didn't have other jobs to work at because their job was full-time serving the Lord, serving God. So... In so doing, God said, okay, this is how you're going to be taken care of. And you're going to be taken care of by the people who brought in their tithes, the people that brought in the first fruits and all these, these sacrifices and ordinance that they were doing, they would partake of that. And that's how they were, they were maintained and taken care of. And um, he says that even the Levites, though, had to pay a tenth of the tithe. So everything that came in they were giving a tenth because that was going unto the Lord. And that was being a heave offering. And it says the heave offering then um, would go for Aaron the priest. And um, everybody was required basically to, to, to pay this tithe. Even the people who were receiving the money, they paid a tenth of the tithe. We'll keep reading there. Look at verse number 25 and numbers, 29 in Numbers 18. It says, Out of all your gifts, ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof, out of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, When ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the winepress. So he's saying that basically for the Levites it's the same thing as if you know, they had increase of their threshing floor, of the winepress, of all these other things that everyone else is paying tithes of. When they gave the, the best of their gifts that they received, that that's how it was counted the same way for them. Um, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 14. If you're there in Numbers, let's turn over in Deuteronomy. We're going to be in chapter 14. Just the next book over, Deuteronomy 14. Look at verse number 22 of De Deuteronomy 14. The Bible reads, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So here he's given us one of the reasons why they needed to tithe. He's, he's commanding, saying, look, you need to tithe all the increase of your fields, all the increase of your wine, your corn, the oil, the first things that I heard, the flocks, everything that comes out, you need to tithe that you may as learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And you might say, well, that's kind of strange. Why would I need to learn to fear the Lord? Because when you don't give God what belongs to him, guess what? He's going to He's going to make things a lot more difficult for you. So, so he could, he's very capable of making sure that you're not producing as much. He'll, he can take back that tithe that belongs to him, whether you voluntarily give it to him or not, and can make things a lot worse. And he's just saying, look, and it's just like with everything else. There's a blessing or a curse. If you decide to obey God's commandments, hey, you're going to be blessed. He'll bless you for that. And, and if you decide to just ignore them, and, and not obey him and not do what he's told us to do, then, then you've got a curse to face. And it's, it's no different with the tithe. Look at verse number 24. It says, And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice 
thou and thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat, and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. So we see here basically earlier in verse 25, he's saying, okay, if you've got the first fruits, but you have to travel a long way to get to the tabernacle or to get to the temple, he's saying you could convert that into money. You, could, you don't have to, to bring all, you know, if you have a lot of stuff, especially it's going to be really hard for you to bring all of this food, all these animals and everything else to bring them to sacrifice, that it's just too much to bear to bring it that far. Then he said, you could convert it to money. And then when you get there, when you get to the tabernacle, then he says, spend that money on these other things, on this food or you know, drink, sheep, whatever your soul desires, whatever you like, and then bring that as your tithe, as the sacrifice unto the Lord. And it's really interesting the way he set this up because not only are you taking care of the Levite, as we mentioned earlier, but he also designed this that you need to, because this also takes care of the stranger, the foreigners, the fatherless, the widows, you know, all these people who might not have any means of income. This is a way to support them. As I preached in Ruth chapter 2 on Wednesday night, there was the, the gleanings, right? People who owned fields. And you're not supposed to glean the field and just take all of that fruit in. You were supposed to leave some of that for the fatherless, for the widows, for the poor to be able to support themselves and to go out and get some food that they're not just, just completely neglected because they have no source of income. Well, it was also the same thing for the tithe and for God's house to be able to take care of these people as well that this, this money came forth from the tithe. And it's the same thing carries over even today in New Testament churches. The Bible says pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows. And um, man, I'm going to screw up that verse. It's in James chapter number one. He says, pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And you know, one of the things that the church does is to help people out. And, you know, we help people out financially if necessary or, you know, providing food, providing things like that. We're here to help the fatherless, the widows. And the only way we can do that is by, you know, when, when money comes into the church, into the house of God, then we, could, we can also help to take care of the people the same way that was done in Deuteronomy 14 in, um, in God's house there, that the tithes would help to pay for that and to help those people to get what they need. Now, we've seen a lot of references to the land, you know, to the fruits of the land and the animals. And that makes sense because for the vast part of history, people have been more agriculturally, the economy was more based on agriculture and that type of stuff. And, um, but there's some people that claim today that the tithe was only an Old Testament thing and it was to take care of the Levites only, but since the Levitical priesthood's gone, they'll say that, well, there's, the tithe is no longer important. We shouldn't do that anymore. That was something that was only for them, and that was only applied to people who farmed the land or who were husbandmen. And I believe that to be completely false for many reasons. We're getting into a few of them now. The Bible gives us example, first of all, the Bible gives us example of people tithing prior to the Levitical priesthood. So if you were to say you know, that it only is for the Levites and that was the, the reason and since the Levitical priesthood is gone in the New Testament, we no longer have to pay that tithe. Well, what about when Abraham paid tithes? In Hebrews chapter 7, the Bible says um, in verse number 1, talking about Melchizedek, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So we see here, when Abraham went out, and he destroyed those kings when they took Lot captive. There's the kings of, of um, Sodom and all the other kings. You know, they went out, the five kings against the four kings. They went out and, um, well, they had this battle. And Abraham went out basically to rescue Lot. 
and he did that. He came back with a bunch of spoil, right? With 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 the, a lot of the stuff that the other people had and that maybe they had taken from other people that they conquered whatever he came back with the spoil but he made sure that God we see here that was an Old Testament visiting of Jesus Christ the king of Salem the king of peace um, the king of righteousness because it says he was without father without mother right no beginning of days or end of life that's Jesus Christ and and Abraham paid the tithe he gave him the tenth of that spoil, of that increase that they received when they went out from that battle. He says in verse 4 of Hebrews 7, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So all that to say this, you know, this was an example of Abraham paying tithes prior to the Levitical priesthood. And this is even saying that, look, even Levi paid tithes. Even Levi, who was going to be the one to receive the tithe and, and all the seed of Levi were going to receive those tithes. They paid tithes unto Christ, unto God, to where, where, you know, where it ultimately belongs. And we also saw that Jacob vowed to tithe in Genesis 28. It says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. There we see Abraham and Jacob boast both tithing, both prior to the Levitical priesthood. So it didn't start with the, with the Levitical priesthood, this, this idea of giving, Todd, giving God the tenth of our increase. And also, you know, the opening scripture stated that God wanted meat in his house. Right? The, 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 the children of Levi were doing the ordinances, were filling the role of serving God continually. That was their full-time job, was to serve God. And God wanted them to be fed. God wanted there to be meat in his house. Now, do you think about this? If, if it was only for the Levitical priesthood, well, does God have a house today? I believe God has a house today. It's in the local churches. Now, it's not a temple it's not the tabernacle. Those things don't exist anymore. In the New Testament, that is one of the things that change. But now God's house is found in your local church. And do you think that God all of a sudden now doesn't want there to be food in his house? Of course he does. The Bible says that the laborer is worthy of his hire. And the person, the man of God, or the people in, that are running the church, that are operating the church full time, whether it be one person or you know, multiple people that are working full time to serve the Lord, ought to be paid by those tithes, ought to be taken care of um, through that mechanism of paying the tithes. Proverbs, verses three, Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Again, he kind of gives that reassurance saying that, look, if you do this, you know, prove me. I will pour out, I will open up heaven and pour out blessings upon you. He said, you will be taken care of. Same thing in Proverbs 3 here. He says, look, honor the Lord. And it's not for, you know, for anyone else, but for God when you pay that tithe. He says, honor the Lord with thy substance, the things that you have, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Now, just to be a little bit of, a little practical here now, if you see, we see a lot of scriptures here on the tithe and the tenth. Well, how does that apply to us today? And I'll just, I'll just let you guys know the way that I do my tithing and the way that, that I look at this. And you know what? If, if you disagree with some of these points, well, look, whatever. Okay, you could, you could figure it out for yourself, but see if this makes sense to you. And, and I'll tell you exactly why I do what I do. First of all, right here we saw in Proverbs, it says, um, 
honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So I basically look at all of my increase, not just my paycheck, but we'll start off with that, right? Um, when I look at my paycheck, my increase is, is um, what I receive for the work that I do. Now, I believe that God deserves the first fruits. Like he says right here, it's the first. He gets paid first. You know, everything else, if I have bills and everything else, I would get paid. Look, I'm going to make sure that God gets the first fruits. Now, every time I get paid, the government likes to stick their hands into my paycheck and take some money out, right? They like to make sure that they get theirs. Well, do you think that the government's more important than God and that they should get, they should get that money? And, and basically, the reason why I'm saying that is because I, when I pay my tithe, I pay it on what I gross, so if I earn, I, I, get, I have a certain wage that's agreed upon with my employer. So I make you know, X amount of dollars per hour. So when I, I make that money, I grow a certain amount of money. Well, the government's going to come and take some of that money away, but I still earn that money. And the way I look at it, I say, well, I'm going to pay my tithe. Hey, God's going to get the first fruit, so I base my 10% based off of that gross, not based off of what the government already stole from me. Um, and again, I mean, if you got the difference of opinion on this, you know, that's between you and God, but just to give you the reasoning behind it, you know, I figure it based on that gross. And um, the other thing I also do, though, is that I factor in things like benefits that my employer is actually paying money for, like with my health insurance and things like that. They're actually, you know, I'm, I'm increasing, I'm receiving a benefit by them paying a certain amount of money for me to receive, you know, health insurance, dental insurance, these types of things. So I figure out how much money am I receiving as a result of that. Because it is an increase. When I work for this stuff, I'm gaining that. I'm increased by having that. I wouldn't have had it if I didn't, you know, if I didn't work there. And it's a, it's a bonus. It's a benefit. But I believe that I'm, you know, I'm being blessed by having that extra inc increase added to my income. So I figure that out and I include that in my bottom line of what am I going to tithe on. Now, not only that, let's say you don't work for somebody, but you sell your own things, you make them or whatever. The increase is based off of your profit. So like if you're running some kind of business, you obviously have to pay for your materials. Uh, you know, you build something and you sell it. That's going to come from the net because that's your increase. Obviously, you know, you're not going to tithe off of the, um, the total amount that you sell it for. You have to do the total minus the things that it costs you to actually build it. But um, and then third, the third thing I do when I, when I make my tithe is because it's based off of my increase, it's not just my paycheck or the things that I make through selling money. I also do it on gifts that we receive, like in our family, when, at Christmas time or whenever, when anytime people decide to give us a gift and it's, it's an increase to us, then I just simply put a value on that and the things that we receive and I just give God the tenth of that. The Bible says in James 1.17, it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And then what I take away from that is, hey, look, all the good gifts that we get in our lives, every perfect gift, that comes from God. You know, obviously there's people giving you gifts that love you and stuff, but ultimately I'm going to thank God for all the blessings that we receive, all the gifts that we receive. And when you start to do this, believe it or not, this is really going to help you appreciate everything that God has done for you and how much he truly has blessed you. Because when we take the time, we'll sit down, I'll sit down with my wife every, every week or every two weeks and just say, okay, what have we received? And we start to think in our heads, well, you know, my dad gave me this, my mom gave me this and other people, you know, like you really start to recognize how much other people do for you and how much that, that, you know, you, you sit down and just take a, take a break and say, wow, you know, we really are blessed because it's easy in this lifetime to get, to get distracted. Things go bad. It's so easy to focus on the negative. You know, man, I got this big bill. I got this big medical bill to pay or whatever because, you know, this bad accident happened and you can get overwhelmed with focusing on the negative things because it could be so stressful for you. But when you sit down and say, well, let's look at all the things that I've received. Hey, that could, that really gives you that thanksgiving and, and the, the humility of saying, wow, you know what? God really is good. People have really done a lot for me. And I think, I, I mean, we get blown away sometimes when we start going through stuff like we've really received a lot of stuff. We really have been blessed tremendously. And you start putting dollar amounts on this and it really just, it really just makes us thankful. And, you know, I've done this for years and years and years. And, and honestly, it really helps me have more appreciation and more love for people as a result as well. I mean, when you start noticing and really being thankful and appreciating what they do for you, 
know, that, that influences you. That, that, that'll help you to have more love for people. Um, obviously, you know, it's not that, and it's because it's not that they're trying to buy your love for you or anything like that. But you can recognize and see, wow, this person really cared enough about me to give me these things. And you take the time to count them out and say, wow, okay, this is, I've increased this much. And this wasn't even for my own earnings or my own gains. And um, basically, so that's, that's essentially how we, you know, how I do my tithing, how I figure out how to give God what he deserves based on all of my increase. Now let's, we're going to shift gears here from the tithe and differentiate this from offerings or from alms because I want, we shouldn't confuse these two. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 if you would. Matthew chapter 6. First book in New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. People have a tendency to confuse this because they'll say, oh, you know, they like to, to you, you know, they'll try to use a scripture for showing, oh, you shouldn't give tithes or that like you shouldn't use tithe envelopes or you shouldn't keep track of this stuff or whatever. Because in Matthew 6, look at verse number 1, it says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Now it's important to note that, look, he's talking about alms. Alms are different than the tithe. The tithe simply just means a tenth. Alms are something that you give. It's charity. It's extra. It's an offering that you're giving. It's like a free will offering. If your left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, you couldn't calculate 10%. I mean, you have to know what you're doing when you're, when you're giving that tenth of your income. But what he's saying here, and the whole point of this is saying, look, if you're going to give, first of all, don't make a big announcement and a big deal over it. Don't let, you know, because that just completely defeats the purpose of it. Anyways, if you really want to help people out, as opposed to have, say, everyone look at me, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're going to have your reward. And look what happened to Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts when, um, you know, people were laying down, they'd sell property, they'd lay it down at the apostles' feet because they just wanted everyone to be taken care of. They had all things common. They wanted to promote the word of God and spreading the, the gospel. So the people were given all this money to, to help them, to help support these preachers and the apostles to go out and do God's work. And then Ananias and Sapphira are saying, oh, okay. Uh, I see there's this big show going on, so we're going to say that we sold our property and we gave all of it to God. And they're going to say, you know, like, yep, we gave everything to God. Here's everything. But they, they lied in their hearts and they kept back part of it. And God killed them. They fell down dead. And he says, look, you haven't lied unto men. You've lied unto the Holy Ghost. And, um, you know, God, God treated that pretty seriously, but they were just doing it to be seen of men. That's all they cared about. You know, they wanted to keep back the part for themselves. They were greedy in their hearts and they just wanted to get the glory of giving that type of a, of a huge, you know, contribution. And he's saying here, look, let your alms be secret. You just, if something comes into your heart, you want to help people out, you want to support them, amen, give them that. Don't even, don't even worry about yourself. You, you, you could give that offering, you could give that blessing to people, you could help people out and give them the alms, but don't make a big show about it. And he says, your alms that are in secret, he says, your father which seeth in secret, your God sees what you're doing. God, no, no one else has to know about that. God knows what you're doing. And God will reward thee openly, he says. In Luke chapter 11, verse 38, if you would turn, to, uh, turn to the book of Luke, if you would, Luke chapter 11, and we're going to be in Luke 12 right after that. The Bible says in Luke 11, verse number 38, the Bible reads, um, And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. And that last verse there, verse 42, 
You know, a lot of people like to, to point to that again to say, oh yeah, see, the Pharisees tithe and they care about tithing, but God doesn't care about tithing. That's not what that verse says. He says, look, you tithe, and, and what he's pointing out here is that the Pharisees tithe, you know, mint, rue, all manner of herbs, like the smallest thing. So like they're paying attention to this tithe way down to, to the really small details, right? To the smallest things that they get. And he's not rebuking them for tithing. What he's rebuking for is that that's what they're focused on as opposed they passed over judgment and love of God. Look, judgment and love of God are way more important than, you know, focusing on these tithes. That has the priority, right? Way over the tithe. And that's why he said, these ought ye to have done. Talking about their tithing. You ought to have done that and not to leave the other undone. He said, you shouldn't just leave the others undone. You need to do both. You need to do all of it. So let's not misinterpret this verse and saying, oh, yeah, see, you shouldn't tithe. No, he's saying you ought to have done this and the other. But judgment and love of God is more important than the tithe. Look at Luke chapter 12, the next chapter over. 12, Luke 12, 33. Luke 12, 33, the Bible says, Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So here we see an admonition here. Look, sell your goods. Who cares about them? He says, give alms. Help people out. And he says, in so doing, basically, you're going to provide bags which wax not old. You're, going to, you're earning yourselves treasures in heaven. God sees the things that you do in secret. When you decide to help people out, you, you have some, some goods, you have some you know, some kind of increase, you sell them and you go to, to help other people out, help people in need, God's going to see that. Don't sound the trumpet before you do that, but God's going to see that and you're going to earn for yourselves treasures in heaven by taking care of these people that are in need, taking care of the poor, taking care of the fathers, taking care of the widows, taking care of the needy. God sees that and he's going to take care of you and he says, for your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Meaning, don't focus on the things that you have and being so happy and proud and lifted up. And if, hey, I've got all this stuff. Hey, this is great. You know, no, sell that stuff. And where your, you know, where your treasure is, if you're focused on these things, hey, your heart's going to be on these things. You're not going to be worried about other people. You're going to be thinking about yourself and how much more you can accumulate for yourself. But if you're thinking on, you know what, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to sell it and I'm going to help this person out who really has a need. Instead of me having all this luxury, I'm going to go help this person out. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we ought to have our treasures in heaven so that our heart can be on godly things and on heavenly things. Acts chapter 3, verse number 1, talking about alms. The Bible says in Acts 3, 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So basically, you know, again, we see here just kind of more proving what alms are, that it's not the tithe. It's just, it's, here's someone, he was lame. He couldn't walk. Right from his mother's womb, he had a disability. He was not able to go out and work the way that other men would be able to work, going out into the field, you know, doing any type of manual labor, any type of work like that. So basically, he had to just ask people for for charity. He had to sit at the church. He went to church and he would sit at the gate and he would ask people and just say, "Hey, can you help me out? Can you give me some alms?" And and this is what he did. And of course, Peter and John, you know, he answers them and says, "You know, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee." And he heals them there. But um, you know, the alms he was asking for, it was not the tithe. He wasn't asking them to pay a tithe. He was just saying, "Hey, can you give me some? You know, can you help me out and give me some charity?" And this is the type of thing that God's talking about. Hey, don't let you know, let your left hand not know what your right hand doeth, or the other way around. And he says, um, you know, if you're going to help people out, just do it. You don't need to broadcast. You don't need to, to tell everyone, hey, I just helped this guy out. I did all this stuff for him. Don't do that. You're going to be bringing the, the, the glory upon yourself, which is not the point of helping people out at all. It's just to, to help them out. And God will see what you do and will bless you for that. And then in um, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, you have to turn, well, turn to 1 Corinthians 9, if you would. 1 Corinthians 9. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, 
As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to you to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And here we see again, there's a collection being taken for the saints. For the saints that were at Jerusalem, people who were in need, saved people, you know, people who went to church, loved God, but there's a collection being made. And um, this is in the New Testament. This is, this is what's happening in the churches where he says, you know, people just giving some money to help others that were in need, other saved people, other people, other of the saints that needed it. And Paul was going to go and help deliver it. Now, if you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to see here, we actually read this this morning as our, in our text verse. But it fits in perfectly with the sermon tonight. We're going to see, you know, what are the tithes used for? I'm going to kind of go into that real quick and then we're going to wrap it up and be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1, it says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord in Cephas? Or I only in Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? He's saying, do we have, don't we have power not to work? See, the apostle Paul and Barnabas, they did work. In their ministry and their serving God and their evangelism and going out and starting churches and working for God, they also were tent makers. You know, they, they had another job. They had another source of income. But there was a reason why they were doing that. For one, they were helping people understand that, look, you need to work hard. And they're saying, we're not taking any of the money that you give unto us, although we could. It is completely lawful and right for us to be receiving money for the work that we're doing. But they say, no, you know what? We're going to forbear that. We're, gonna, we're not going to do that. We're going to instead, we're going to show you what it's like to work hard. We're going to give you a good example to follow. You need to work hard with your hands, pr you know, provide for your own family. We're providing for ourselves and we're going to do the work of God on top of that. So they just decided to go above and beyond. But, it, but by seeing this verse here, He's saying they have the power to forbear working. Verse number seven says, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? He's saying, look, if you're going to do some work, look, if you have a garden and I'm going to work on this garden and I'm going to do all this stuff, who does that and then doesn't eat of it? Right? Of course, I'm going to, I'm going to partake of that food. When I put in all this work, yeah, of course I'm going to partake of that. He says, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. Verse number 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. He said, look, the ox that you use, because back then they'd use the ox, they'd stamp the corn out to do their work. And he's saying, you're not going to muzzle it in the sense that, you know, he can't eat of any of the work that he's doing for. He's doing his manual labor, so you're going to let that ox eat a little bit of that corn and he stamp it out. And then he says, but then he goes on further to explain, he says, doth God take care for oxen? Like, did God make that law or that rule because he really cares about that ox eating that food? He says, not at all. Verse number 10, he says, or saith he altogether for our sakes. So did he, did he say it because he cared about the ox or for us? He says, for our sakes, no doubt. Of course it's for our sakes. He says, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope shall be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying, look, we're doing all of this spiritual work. We're, do, you know, we're preaching the gospel. We're going out and doing this hard work for God. Is it really that big of a deal if we, just re, if we gain some of that, the, the carnal things, you know, just the, the money and, and that type of stuff just to get some food to help provide for us? Is that really a big deal when we're doing you know, basically greater things? You're working for God. You're doing things, a job that's extremely important to God. Is it really a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Verse number 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? He says, nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He's saying we have not used this power because they had the power to use, but they chose 
not to use it. The same way that I'm choosing not to receive any type of income for the church because I want to further the church and be able to use that money as much as possible for other things than for myself. I'm providing for my family with another job already. I want to just do the best I can to further this. But ultimately, my plan and my goal is to just be completely full-time pastoring. And at that point, yes, I will be receiving some kind of payment to help support myself and my family in order to do God's work completely and fully with all of my time. Because see, part of the problem with having this job is that I can't go out and do all of the work that I want to do. I would like to be out reaching people, knocking on doors, talking to people, helping people out more, as much as I possibly can with all of my waking hours. But it simply isn't possible because I obviously have financial needs that need to be met. And this is exactly what was going on in the New Testament church. And you think about even the Apostle Peter, right? Um, Jesus told him from henceforth, because he was a fisherman. That was his job. That's how he supported himself. That's how he supported his family. And Jesus told him henceforth, thou shalt, thou shalt be a fisher of men. And he left his job. He left his net. He left his boat and started following Jesus. He said, this is your job now. You do not have this old job anymore. And you remember after Jesus Christ died and he resurrected, you know, Peter says, you know, I go a fishing. And then he brought a bunch of people with him. And he went back to his old job. And then when Jesus saw him and he met him, you know, he was, he was ashamed. He was naked in the boat. He came, he swam up and, you know, and, and, and saw, you know, when they saw Jesus on the shore. And um, Peter ends up getting rebuked. And basically, you know, his job was not to go back to that old job. He needed to keep doing the work that God had laid out for him to do. And um, the way that he was supposed to be getting supported was um, by living. Well, here we'll see in verse 13. This is how it is. It says, do not um, do not <clears throat> do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar even so hath the lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel the people who are doing that work that is how they should live that is how they should be taken care of so you know all all this stuff just hopefully you know you get a little bit of idea between the difference between tithes and offerings now in our church we, we take an offering at every service, you know, whether you, whether you put in 10% or whether you put in whatever you put in, you know, I don't know what you make. It doesn't matter. I'm not sitting here keeping track of who's tithing and who's not. You put in what you put in, but what, one of the things we do that's separate is on Wednesday nights, we, the money that we pull in goes completely to support our missionaries. And that would be like um, what they did in 1 Corinthians 16, the collection for the saints. And we go to completely support people who are going out and evangelizing and, and doing that work of God outside of this church. People who we know are doing hard work. Hey, we're going to try to help them the best that we can. And um, the stuff that we pull in on Sunday is going to be more to you know, promote our church to go out and help the people in our community and our needs and you know whoever works and is employed in God's service that's where all of that money is going to go to all of our materials all of the songbooks bibles everything that we give out all of that stuff gets paid and funded by those those tithes and those offerings and um, you know hopefully that clears up you know this isn't the most exciting sermon but it's important um, it's an important part of our Christian life, I believe. You know, that I believe that the tithe is in effect today. You know, there's a lot of people out there. There's, there's house church movements and other people will try to tell you that, no, no, it's for the Old Testament. You know, it's not for us today. But the plan, I mean, it only makes sense. It makes sense that in order for, for, for the local church to be funded and, and, to, and to grow and to do the things that it needs to do and to help people out, there needs to be money coming from somewhere. And it's going to be coming from the tithes and offerings. So, um... You know, hopefully you learned a little bit of something tonight. There's a lot. There's a lot more scripture on this. I didn't have a chance to get to it all. Obviously, um, we're restricted by the amount of time we have. But, um, anyways, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I pray that maybe something that was preached tonight will will help people to have a better understanding of the tithes and the offerings and the alms and and how we ought to view each one. And and Lord, I pray that you would please just um, Help us not to neglect this area of our lives, that we wouldn't rob you. Lord, I pray that, that um, people would understand that 
you know, I'm not preaching this subject just because I want to get paid more and that, that I'm just preaching for, for filthy lucre's sake. Dear God, you know my heart and, and hopefully the others here do too, but I'm going to preach. I don't want anyone to be out of, out of, um, out of your will in any way, whether that be in tithes or whether it be in any other aspect of their lives, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us all as a church to grow, help us to, to do what's right. And Lord, give us a heart that, that thinks about other people and that cares about other people enough to help them out when they're in need, to look for the Father, you know, to help the fatherless and the widows and, and those that, that have need. Since you've blessed a lot of people here, I know for sure, you've, you've given us a lot of abundance, dear Lord. You've, you've given us so many things. And we're very thankful for that, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.